So welcome everybody to the next edition of Presenting Our Presence. And so happy to be here today with co-host Michelle DeRocher and our guest that you will get to meet in a very short period of time, a colleague of mine in the Faculty of Education, Melissa Trombley. So I'll invite Michelle to greet you all, and then we'll turn it over to Melissa to introduce herself in the way that she wishes to. Michelle, good morning. It's good to see you and have you as a co-host. Thank you, Florence. I'm really excited to uh, be here to co-host with you again. Um, I really enjoy doing this uh, podcast with you, with Cindy. It's always uh, really great conversations. So I'm Michelle DeRocher. I'm from the Fishing Lake Métis Settlement and uh, I work in the Office of the President as the Executive Operations Coordinator. And um, I'm really excited to, uh, to be here to, to hear from Melissa. So Melissa, I will turn it over to you to introduce yourself. Okay, thank you. Really excited to be here and just um, grateful to have been invited. So um, my last name is Tremblay, the name that I took when I got married. Um, but my family name is Daniels. So on my mom's side, I come from a long line of um, English and Norwegian and, and French relatives. Um, and on my dad's side is a long line of Métis people. Um, so on my dad's maternal side, my dad's um, mom was the Belrose and my dad's uh, paternal side were the Belcourts and the Dagnos and also Pauls. Uh, so my parents both grew up in the Lexington area of Alberta. Um, and my family is part of the Métis Nation of Alberta, so I'm a citizen of MNA um, and also part of the Lexington uh, Métis Community Association. And I am an associate prof in the Faculty of Education here at the University of Alberta. Um, so I'm part of the School and Clinical Child Psychology Program, which means that I'm also a registered psychologist. And um, in addition, I also wear the hat of um, Indigenous Liaison with the Canada FASD Research Network. So Melissa, could you tell us just about what the FASD Research Network is and, and um, what took you into the work of being a psychologist and a registered psychologist? Yeah. Um, so the Canada FASD Research Network is, um, FASD stands for Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder. Um, when I was a doctoral student, I worked under the supervision of um, Dr. Jackie Pye, who is also a prof here in the Faculty of Education. Um, and her expertise, much of her expertise as a neuropsychologist is in the area um, of FASD. So supporting um, mostly children and youth, but also adults who uh, live with FASD. And that's kind of where my interest in the area started to root, I guess. Um, I was really fortunate when I was a doctoral student to work on a couple of projects that um, took me in different places across Alberta um, and also up to White Horse as well to work on some projects around FASD. Um, so I worked with Jackie and some other colleagues on evaluating um, the PCAP program, the Parent-Child Assistance Program, uh, for women who were at risk of having a child with FASD. And um, we looked at evaluating how the PCAP was being delivered in different First Nations communities. So um, that was one of my favorite projects I worked on. I remember I was uh, pregnant with my first son um, and it was October and I was going up to um, some of the communities around high level and uh, with a couple of ladies from one from Alexis First Nation um, and one from around Barhead. And I said, oh, I'll drive. It's October. Um, we don't have to worry about snow at least. But we went up there and experienced the worst snowstorm maybe that I've ever seen. And so I think it took us like 10 hours to get home. Um, and of course, I was very pregnant at the time. I think I was like eight months, seven months pregnant. 
Um, so stressing the whole way, but that was, um, yeah, just one of my favorite experiences as a, a doctoral student researcher, um, getting to travel to communities that I had never been to before and just um, being welcomed and learning all about some of the the different amazing programming that they were implementing. Um, so as part of the Canada FASD Research Network, um, once I became a faculty member, um, I was invited into the CAN FASD family um, and they have a number of research leads in different areas. So um, we have Jackie Pye as an intervention research lead and um, people like uh, Dorothy Badry, who's a child welfare research lead, all kinds of um, amazing folks. And so my area is on uh, working with Indigenous communities, which um, I have um, been learning a lot and continue to learn about what it means to um, examine different um, health inequities among Indigenous peoples like FASD. Um, and also do that from a strengths-based approach in a way that is non-stigmatizing um, and where we're not identifying um, health issues like FASD as Indigenous problems, right? But um, also recognizing that there are unique factors that um, contribute to, to these health issues um, among Indigenous children and families and people. Um, so that was a long-winded way to answer the question about um, Canada FASD Research Network. Um, and you would also ask just what kind of interested me or brought me to being a psychologist. Um, I, when I was in my undergrad, um, I, I decided to pursue a major in psychology. Um, I was the I'm the first person in my family to attend university um, out of anyone I know, I guess. So any, you know, parents, aunties, uncles, cousins. Um, and so I just, psychology was kind of the, if you don't know what you want to do, you might as well major in psychology. Um, and at the U of A, we have a, uh, I think it's called the Cooperative Work Experience Program now. But um, when I was doing my undergrad, which I was just thinking I started um, almost 20 years ago now. <laughs> so I've been at the university in some in some way for the last 20 years. Um, they have a, a program where after you finish three years of your undergrad, you work for a whole year uh, full time in a placement. And so I did my placement at Forensic Assessment and Community Services and um, had some incredible mentors there who were psychologists. Um, and they just really helped me um, understand the potential, I guess, of the field to uh, be able to pursue different directions, whether it's research or practice. Um, I didn't actually expect that I would get into a graduate program in psychology. So I didn't apply for a master's in psychology. Um, and I, when I was still completing my undergrad, I remember I went to a, um, a grad studies fair at the U of A and met someone from uh, human ecology. And uh, Rebecca Gokert was a relatively new professor at the time. So Rebecca is now in the, the School of Public Health. Um, so met Rebecca in sort of a meandering way. She's also a registered psychologist and she was doing research with Bent Arrow at the time. And I got to do my thesis work with Rebecca, just trying to understand how Indigenous children navigate the world in terms of um, developing their social and emotional skills. And uh, that was really transformative because I uh, truly had never been exposed to community-based research before and didn't know that as a researcher, you could work in community um, and was also introduced to the world of qualitative research. So Rebecca really encouraged me to 
um, apply to the doctoral program in school and clinical child psychology. Again, I didn't think that I would be um, competitive to get in because it is, um, you know, a pretty, um, they have pretty rigid requirements in terms of um, prerequisites and entry and that kind of thing. But it was the right path for me. So um, I was accepted into the program. And that's when I um, decided, well, I guess this means I'm going to become um, a psychologist and pursued all of the requirements for that. And and that's kind of brought me here. But I always knew um, that I wanted to be in some sort of human services or or helping field. So, Wow, thank you. Um, Michelle, I'll turn it over to you. I have tons of questions, but I'll let you go first. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> Thanks, Florence. Um, Melissa, that's an amazing like journey that, to go on. Um, when you were doing your undergrad, did you imagine that that being a psychologist was going to be the the end goal, or was it just like like at what point in in that in those years did you decide that that was going to be the goal? Because as you mentioned, like when you when you're first starting your undergrad program. You just you just pick some place to start and go, and you ended up it going full full all the way through it in that kind of program. Was that something like midway, or when did you decide like, yeah, this is this is it? Yeah, um, I I think when I was when I was doing my undergrad, I um, I remember taking a philosophy course with. Um, professors who were co-teaching and they were just so passionate and knowledgeable and um, seemed to care so much about students even though it was a huge class it was a it was probably 200 uh, students in the in this undergrad philosophy class and I remember thinking um, how much I would love to be a professor um, but I always had this nagging feeling of like, well, it's not really my place. Like I got here to university, but someone's going to find out one day that I don't really belong here. I think lots of us can identify with that feeling. Yes. That's that imposter syndrome. Yeah. Thing, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, I, I would teach a course in the summer. Um, I have for the last couple of summers, as part of the um, Indigenous Summer Institute, which uh, has been incredible. But one of the uh, articles that I get students to read is called The Psychology of Invisibility. Um, I think the authors are Freiburg and Townsend. It's an older article, like maybe 15 years ago. Um, but it talks about how it takes a leap of your imagination um, if you are not necessarily represented in certain places. Um, so I really feel that in, or felt that, I guess, as an undergrad student in terms of um, academic spaces. Now I'm so lucky to be um, in the Faculty of Education where I see Métis and First Nations and Indigenous people um, represented really well. But um as a, an undergrad student, it was uh, really difficult for me to imagine, you know, going to grad school even. It always felt like sort of, I don't want to say accidents, but sort of like an accident. Like, oh, well, I managed to, to slide into this master's program. And then, you know, through the relationships that I had, I managed to get into this PhD program. Um, and now I'm here. But I definitely didn't have a an end goal of becoming a psychologist. I think there is um, sort of a, within the profession of psychology, um, there's tr traditionally been sort of this elitist kind of attitude of like, you know, it's so competitive to get in. Um, and so that's why I didn't even uh, apply to a, a psych 
master's program because I thought, well, I'm not even going to bother. It's too competitive. But uh, I always, in the back of my mind, I guess, I thought, well, ideally, I would love to do that, but just not sure if, if I'll be able to get there. So, yeah. Yeah, that's really beautiful, Melissa. I'm going to, um, now, I too appreciated hearing the the journey that you took to be in, I, the, some of the experiences that you had along the way. And I know that you've been doing long time work around early learning. And so I'm wondering if you could talk a bit about the early learning and in community early learning work that you've been engaged in recently. And then subsequent to that, I think it's so profound that you were pregnant with your first child on that first trip and just how the work that you've been engaging in is also shaping who you are as a parent. Sure. Yeah. Those are great questions. Um, yeah. When I, so when I was a doctoral student, I was in my third year and that's when I was pregnant with my son, my oldest, um, and I ended up doing my research, my dissertation research with the Terra Center for Teen Parents. Um, and I had been working with them, you know, since the very beginning of my doctoral studies. So it was around three years I had been engaged with the Terra Center. So they're a nonprofit in Edmonton that that serves pregnant and parenting teens and families. And um, I... I remember when I had my son, so he was born in December 2016, and uh, I think I took him to a focus group when he was two weeks old in January, um, but having, being pregnant and engaging with uh, teen parents and teen moms especially um, just made me human to them, made me less of a researcher and more of just a fellow mom. Um, and I learned so, so much from, from these parents. They did like to scare me a little bit and tell me horror stories about what it was like to give birth. And um, that sort of shifted the power dynamic too, right? Because it was like, I'm, I'm coming in as a researcher and a psychologist in training um, and I want to learn from you about what being a teen parent means, what it means to you to raise your children in healthy ways. Um, and they had lots to share with me about things that I hadn't experienced yet because um, I hadn't had my son yet. And then when he was a newborn, it was also really cool when they would give me advice about, uh, you know, breastfeeding, for example, or uh, sleep routines, things like that. Um, it's funny because I, I had presented some of my research on working with the Terra Center to an undergrad psychology class. And there was an article that we had written about, about the project. And we talked about, um, being really relational in our approach with the Terra Center and with teen parents and, um, even mentioned this unique circumstance of, of me being pregnant and having a child um, while I was doing my data collection and working with the parents. And um, one of the students in the undergrad psych course um, asked a, a question about, well, it actually seems like what you were doing um, was unethical because you were kind of using your pregnancy um, to kind of get close to the parents and get them to share things with you. And it was, it really took me aback and it was um, such an interesting point of reflection because that comes from students who are trained in very, you know, conventional, scientific, experimental um, ways of doing research. So it was like they couldn't even kind of get their heads around um the human the humanity entering into research and how you do research in relationship 
Um, so we had some really good conversations about that and about how um, we can do research in an ethical way. Um, and even, I would argue, in many ways, we have to be relational in our research to do that in an ethical way. But that was that always kind of stuck with me. Um, so in terms of how um, the research work that I do around whether, you know, it's with teen parents or in the early learning space um, is kind of shaping me as a parent, I think um, it has made me so much more reflective. Um, also so much more open to, um, to doing things, to being a parent in, um, in ways that uh, take into account other people's perspectives and, and ways of knowing that I probably wouldn't even, like my eyes wouldn't even be open to these things if not for having the, um, extreme privilege of interacting with with people who um are from all kinds of backgrounds right and um are at different places along their journeys of understanding who they are as parents and and also um indigenous moms who are at different places in their journeys of um of understanding culturally who they are and who their families are and and how they want to raise their children um, in more traditional ways. So um, I think it's shaped me hugely as a parent and I'm, I just have so much gratitude for that. Um, I think I, um, I want, I strive to raise my children in ways that um, align with a lot of the values that I've aligned more and more with as I've learned from other people and been a researcher and instructor. So things like humility and respect and reciprocity um, have always kind of been beneath the surface important to me, but now um, I can be explicit about how I try to live those things. And so I think that makes me um, a more present and compassionate parent, I would say. Um, and part of that has been through the early, the early years program, um, which is a program that was piloted in the Muscogee's community. And my role has been to walk alongside um, home visitors and staff of the early years program to kind of document and evaluate and research how that their processes are going. They're um, an incredible program that is offered now, not just in Muscogee, but in different communities, different First Nations, Métis, Inuit communities across Canada. And um, again, just learning from the home visitors themselves and the cookums and the aunties that are part of that program and also participants has been um, just such a unique experience. And um, if I tie back to, you know, in my undergrad, what I imagined research would be, it's nothing like uh, what I imagined research would be. So um, just really fortunate, I think, to um, have found a place to do um, community grounded research that feeds my soul and feeds my spirit and um, feeds who I am, I think, as a as a parent and just a person in general. This sounds really interesting, Melissa. When when you're doing this kind of this early years program, is that like visiting Muscogee and other communities? Yeah, so the pilot program, it started as a research project um, funded by Brain Canada Foundation. And so um, Dr. Brian Kolb from the University of Lethbridge was the PI for the study. Um, and he started working with the Martin Family Initiative. So they're a nonprofit from uh, Montreal based, and they have a mandate of supporting Indigenous children to reach their potential and, and Indigenous families. Um, so they started this research project to begin implementing this, and not just implementing kind of a canned program, but building um, an early 
we technically it's called an intervention, an early intervention program, but I don't love the word intervention. Um, but an early home visitation program, we'll say, um, with Indigenous communities, Muscochise being the first community where this program was built and developed. Um, and essentially, it's um, home visitors from the community, mostly mums and aunties, but there are um, some male home visitors as well, and gender diverse folks involved. Um, but they that's what they do is they visit moms. So they bring them a bag of groceries um, to kind of thank them for their time every time they visit them weekly and um, just have conversations with them about early childhood development and um, empower them to understand themselves as their, their children's first and best teachers. Um, there's a set of a, a loose kind of, I won't say curriculum, but a, a a loose structure that the program follows in terms of um, a toolbox that has cards with Cree language and um, imagery um, that are kind of pulling from what we know based on empirical research to be some of the most important tenets of early childhood development, but also drawing on Indigenous knowledge as well. Um, and there's group gatherings as part of the program, which has also been really important for moms and families to be able to come together and socialize um, and learn together in a group setting. So it's just an incredible program. And um, I have had the privilege of just being invited alongside uh, the program to help document uh, research and evaluation kind of outcomes for both for accountability to the funder to Brain Canada Foundation, um, but also just for learning. So the program itself wants to know, you know, how many prenatal participants um, are we seeing, for example, and what does that mean? And um, I'm a qualitative researcher, so I love the qualitative side of things where I get to interview uh, participants and staff and understand from their perspectives or, and also from my evaluation and research perspective, what's going really well, um, what can be improved, and also what are some of the policy implications of some of the outcomes we're seeing. That's great. Um, so what, what I was imagining is right now I see a lot of programming that is youth oriented uh, which is still amazing. Like I, in my, in my community, they have a bunch of youth programs. Um, so it's, it's interesting to me now to like see the, the program interest uh, in, in indigenous children kind of get a little bit younger, right? Like just to, to, to see at what stages can, can there be like this kind of participation, this intervention, as you said, um, and, and how, I guess it's going to take some time to figure out how how that changes in like how meaningful it becomes to to how that child is is brought up and how they re, re, like relate back to their um, to their community or like even to their own parents. Uh, what what would you say is the age range? Because I heard you say prenatal, but like, is there kind of like a a cut time when when the people leave this kind of program? Yeah, so um, like you said, we do see lots of um, youth-focused or school-age focused programming for Indigenous kids and the Martin Family Initiative folks, so MFI, um, they have been delivering programming with Indigenous peoples um, for school-age kids, focusing on education outcomes for a number of years, and then um, began to wonder, well, could we do something even earlier? Like before these kids get to school age, um, could we be facilitating supports for families um, right at the beginning? So right at that prenatal stage. So um, the dream is for in the communities where the early years is um, implemented for any mom, um, as soon as she finds out she's pregnant, then she can access a home visitor. Uh, so families get home visits from as soon as they join the program uh, weekly until their child is 12 months of age and then bi-weekly um, up until their child is 24 months of age. And then after that, 
uh, they can access center-based programming. So in Muscochis, they have uh, what's called the Getting Ready for Preschool program, which is part of the early years. So um, it was just recognized that uh, Head Start programs in the community were undersubscribed. And so the Getting Ready for Preschool program, the goal of that is to bring families into a center-based learning um, opportunity so they can see what it's like to have their child interact with other kids their age, kind of listen to a preschool teacher and form relationships with other adults that way. And so it kind of lessens parents' anxiety a little bit about um, what it would be like to send their child to Head Start. And then at the end, the goal is for them to to register for Head Start. So um, mostly in those really early years, so prenatal to preschool ages is the um, age that families are served. That's really cool. Um, yeah, because like you said, Head Start, and I have a three-year-old nephew who is in Head Start right now. So I'm just imagining like how cool that would have been to have my sister-in-law do something like this. She's currently pregnant, actually. So maybe I'll have to have to see what, what they've got going around in, around my community and see if we can get her interested in something like that. That's cool. Um, Florence, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Melissa. And wow, we've had such a fascinating conversation so far. I'm going to ask if there are pieces that you wish to add or say, wow, I wish they had asked me this question about the work that you do and how you are situated in this world as a human being and all of the ways that you're contributing. Yeah, thank you. Um, I guess something that I, I just continue to reflect on as someone who uh, is in both space, like health research and education research spaces, um, and also as a clinician, as a psychologist, um, something that I continue to reflect on and learn about is um, how we work in a way with people that um, really puts into practice some of the buzzwords that we hear a lot, um, like strength-based. People talk about using strength-based approaches when we're doing research or clinical work with Indigenous peoples. But what does that actually mean? Um, Trauma-informed is another kind of popular buzzword that we hear a lot, but sometimes um, we hear it without necessarily understanding what does that actually look like? How do I know if a researcher is working in a trauma-informed way versus not? Um, so that is, those are things that I continue to um, learn from the people and the communities that I'm working with about what that means to them. Um, even words like cultural safety um, is something that I continue to um, think about what does that mean in practice and reflect on how it's not a destination. Um, you aren't necessarily a, a culturally competent researcher or clinician. You can be on a journey toward um, always learning and doing better because that's sort of a moving target, this idea of cultural competence or cultural safety. Um, so that's just kind of where my brain is these days. And I continue to learn, like I said, from the people I work with and other um, Indigenous scholars. And I feel really fortunate to um, have a, or be in a profession where I get to, um, like my research gets to feed my teaching and my teaching gets to feed my research. And all of this too is kind of wrapped up in, in any clinical practice that I'm able to do as well. Um, so yeah, I think that would be the only kind of thing that I wanted to mention. Wow, Melissa. So you also engage in a clinical practice. I did not know that. <laughs> I don't know how you have time given um, all of the ways that you contribute. And it's been such an honor to get to know you a little bit better. And I, um, you know, I remember having the opportunity to observe one of your classes. That was such an honor for me. Um, 
And I just really want to say thank you for joining us on presenting our presence. And um, I, I think that the way that you've ended the conversation is really the work that is happening for Indigenous and non-Indigenous scholars to think deep, excuse me, to think deeply about the phrases that are used, the impact of the phrases used, and what does it mean to not just walk, but or not just use those phrases, but what does it mean to walk and live those phrases as we work with diverse communities and recognize the diversity of nations, communities, humans, right, in the work that we do as researchers and as educators. So thank you so much for joining us today. I'll invite Michelle to also offer our gratitude, and then I will invite you to end us off in whatever way you'd like. Thank you, Melissa. Yes, thank you very much, Melissa. Um, yeah, I'm 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 uh, very grateful for this conversation, and um, I just one of the things that has that has stuck with me is is that that journey that you talked about, and not knowing if, if this was the journey for you. And I just want to say this is this is the journey for you. This is where you're supposed to be. So thank you. Thank you. That means a lot. Um, yeah, and and I think the more I'm able to. Um, engage with Indigenous colleagues and learn from um, from folks here at the university um, who are modeling how to live these values in authentic ways while also, you know, being a part of this institution, um, the better I'm able to do that. And, and also the more, uh, the stronger sense of belonging I feel here. Um, and so always just feel like right at home, um, having these kind of conversations and, and having the opportunity to, to share a little bit. So thank you for, for giving me that opportunity today. Well, we're honored to have you as a guest, Melissa, and I'm so grateful for all of the wisdom that you shared with us today and how you're coming to make sense of the wisdom and, and who you are. And I think, um, your experiences will resonate with a lot. Um, you first generation human to go to university. Um, and then do you belong in an institution? Can I be a researcher? Can I do this? And I want to thank you for sharing with us all of the ways that your life is unfolding. And we're really grateful to have you as a colleague. So thank you so much again. Mm -hmm.